It is controversial, no doubt. It is a marvel of modern engineering. It is the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. The way I look at the F-35, it is an evolution in technology. Colonel Andrew Toth is one of the pilots who's been flying the F-35 for several months at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Just the few sorties that I've flown in it, uh, the capabilities with the radar itself and the capabilities to do mapping of the ground and to target things uh, and for where this system is and its immaturity and the newness of it, got a long way to go but it is still head and shoulders above anything that we have today. So far here at Eglin Air Force Base, they have 22 F-35s that have totaled more than 500 flights since this spring alone. And all those tests have some of the military raving about the jets, saying it's the next phase of their defense of the nation. It's harvesting all the knowledge we've gained since F-117, B-2, all those first attempts at low observable stealthy airplanes. We learned a lot of lessons in that. We learned a lot of lessons in how to build them. We learned a lot of lessons in how to operate them. We learned a lot of lessons in how to maintain them. Marine Colonel Thomas Setti has been working on the F-35s since the design phase. He adds that the plane is designed to keep the pilot well informed during the chaos of battle. The ability for the airplane to see things out in the battle space and take what it sees and present that information to the pilot uh, in what we call sensor fusion. The plane's computers use radar, infrared, and a vast array of sensors and electronics to present information to the pilot right inside the helmet. And this helmet, you have two projectors that will project the image right in front of your eyes. That will show data and graphics, as well as imaging from cameras around the plane, virtually allowing the pilot to look through the aircraft, previously unheard of. More information provided in a clear way can help the pilot quickly understand what is happening with enemies and friendlies in the air and on the ground. And F-35s can share information with each other as well as satellites and ground forces to get a better picture of the battlefield. It can connect all those nodes and that's, that's the key is it, it can be part of that network uh, out there in the battlefield tomorrow. It rattled my house enough that uh, marble tile fell off of my fireplace. Kay Hamilton lives in the shadow of the F-35 testing grounds in Florida. So does Robert Webb. I can tell when they take off. Both are sure this new plane is plenty loud. It has the largest engine ever put in a fighter aircraft. Webb runs a sound and multimedia company now, but used to work as an engineer at Eglin Air Force Base, where the planes are being tested. He likes the F-35, but isn't a big fan of the noise it makes. When the new plane made its first appearance in Florida, he tells us he broke out some of his sound equipment and headed down to the runway at the base. First, he plays us a recording of the F-35 landing. His peak reading, 105 decibels. It's going to be considerably louder than uh, the F-16s. Webb was still recording when an F-16, similar to what the Vermont Guard flies, landed moments later. That F-16 topped out at 97 decibels. Webb says that eight decibel difference means a lot to the human ear. Twice as loud. We also wanted to get a sense of how loud the plane is, so we rented a sound meter. Admittedly, this is not a scientific test. There are a ton of variables here, and I'm no scientist. And here's a big difference. We measure takeoffs of planes, which are louder than landings because the planes use so much power to get airborne. Still, here are the numbers we got from our test when we were on the runway in Florida. As a pair of F-35s took off, 109 decibels for the first and 104 decibels for the second. Again, our test is not scientific, and you certainly don't find a lot of homes sitting on top of a military runway. Webb claims overall, according to his measurements in Florida, the F-35 is a louder plane. The Air Force acknowledges the plane has a lot of power, and they're trying to figure out how and when to use that power. A certain kind of takeoff will, will make it more tolerable on this particular point on the ground uh, and a certain type of profile will make it more tolerable. I mean, within the constraints of being safe, uh, I think you will find that we will operate the airplane to be the best neighbors as, as we can be. Um, but we need some time to figure out what that is as well. We've shown you what one sound expert said about noise F-35s make during landing versus F-16s down in Florida. Then there was our very unscientific sound test of F-35s taking off at the airbase, also in Florida. And now
now we're back in Vermont to check out how loud the F-16s are here. Now for a little perspective on the level of noise we're talking about. A normal conversation is about 60 decibels. The sound of traffic on the road is about 80 decibels. That's at least 90 decibels, and sustained exposure to something that loud can lead to hearing damage. Jet planes are among the loudest machines on Earth. Again, as we did in Florida, we're taking readings from the side of a runway far, far closer than anyone in a home will ever be to those planes. At takeoff in Florida, the F-35 measured from the runway hit a decibel meter reading of 109 on the first takeoff and 104 on the second takeoff. In South Burlington, from the runway, the F-16 hit 113.9 on the first takeoff and 112 on the second. Again, let's be clear, our tests are not scientific, conditions are different, locations are different, and there are a lot of variables. Still, if studies predict the F-35 to be louder, what gives with our test? In the F-16 right now, with the configurations that we're flying, we're pretty much in full AB. Now we cancel it as soon as we can. AB stands for afterburner, a flood of juice to the jet engine that lets it go very fast, very quickly. The F-16s need the afterburner in Burlington. We don't know what the F-35's afterburner sounds like. Folks with the Air Force in Florida say the F-35, with its bigger, better engine, doesn't need to use the afterburner. The Vermont Guard makes the same case here. I'm confident. I mean, it's a fact that we're going to be able to climb out of here in, in, in a lower power setting. So far, we've been talking about takeoff, but what about midair? Sound engineer Bob Webb, who lives in Valparaiso, where the F-35s are being tested, says according to his measurements, the F-35 can make a racket. The first F-35 uh, came over at, uh, and I measured 74 dB. The second one came over and it was 84 dB. So obviously he was putting a little bit more throttle to it to try to maybe catch up to the first one. Which he says emphasizes the importance of power settings. Looks like it can be 810 dB, which is doubling of the sound pressure level. The Vermont National Guard says it will do everything it can to mitigate sound impacts on the community, whether it's when the planes go up, power settings on takeoff, climb angles on takeoff, flight departures, or come down. Because we're part of the local community. We are, you know, their guard, and uh, we want to be good neighbors. We'll probably leave because this is so unacceptable. Eileen Andrioli lives in Winooski. She's worried that the F-35s will be louder than the planes already flying overhead. Loud enough to change her neighborhood. People are fighting for their homes and that puts it on a whole different level. One level that gets a lot of attention is 65 decibels. That's an FAA benchmark on noise levels near an airport. 65 decibels is also about the same level as a conversation between two people. The draft environmental impact statement predicts the F-35s will be 17 decibels louder than the F-16s on takeoff. That would mean nearly a thousand more homes would experience an average sound level of at least 65 decibels. A lot of the homes affected by the new noise footprint are in Winooski, and if the Guard gets six additional jets, the total number goes up to about 1,300. The increase in the decibel levels will cause our homes to be considered unsuitable for residential use. She cites page C14 of the DEIS, which states that areas exposed to a day-night average level above 65 decibels are generally not considered suitable for residential use. In response, the Guard says the FAA's guide is not a hard and fast law or federal mandate and that the responsibility for determining acceptable and permissible land uses remain with local authorities. Winooski Mayor Mike O'Brien says some people in the city have already been living inside a 65 DNL zone for years. He says right now there are no plans to change the zoning. Still, Eileen is worried about her community. Your home is not going to be able to um, to to get the the value of, of the, in the sale that it should because of this designation. She also says the DEIS relies on older census data that doesn't reflect the current community. They used the 2000 census, which didn't show uh, all the uh, refugee population that we have in the city, and it didn't show uh, a lot of the new houses in our downtown. If the noise level in Winooski does go up, she says people invested in their homes would be hurt. Where is Winooski's compensation in this if this is going to come and uh, have these levels? A UVM economist who used to work for the state says home values could be affected, but it's hard to know how much. The value of your house is based in part on the fact that you're in a flight path. 
if now there's more planes or noisier planes or some combination, well, that's going to make it a little bit worse. I've lived here all my life. I've lived under F-4s and 102s a lot louder. Realtor Ernie Pomerlo, speaking with a group that supports the F-35, says if home values can survive that, they'll survive the F-35. We're trying to su show the massive support for this and the fact that it's really good for our region. Supporters circulated a petition that garnered more than 10,700 signatures. Opponents question how many of those people who signed the petition actually live in affected areas. And if they can't agree on something as simple as a petition count, you can imagine the disagreement over what happens if the F-35s don't come here. There's been nothing said officially by anyone that, that this base would close. It's had seven or eight missions over the years. No one has approached me about any option other than flying the F-35. Half of our jobs here are tied to the maintenance of an aircraft. If there's not an aircraft to maintain, then there's no reason for those jobs to exist. Art Wolf says if those jobs do go, it could have a widespread impact. But in the end, he says, like all economic questions, this one involves weighing the pros with the cons. Almost always the case is that when there's costs, the costs are, are impacted on a, a relatively small number of people, and the benefits are widely diffused. So how are you all doing? Is everything okay for you today? Kay Hamilton runs the Compass Rose Restaurant in Valparaiso, Florida. Hey, how you doing? She's also a city commissioner. Good, good. She remembers when word started getting around about the F-35s coming to her town. Rumors started to abound that this particular aircraft was different than the other aircraft. It was much louder. Based on data from the Air Force, if the F-35s at Eglin flew the way the Air Force originally proposed without restrictions, it would be too loud to live in hundreds of homes here in Valparaiso based on FAA standards. We would have lost 35 percent or so of, of our residential area. Uh, we, were, we were being told to make that area either pasture land or industrial uh, usage and it, it would just wreck the city. The city brought in Robert Webb, a sound engineer who used to work on base, in their fight with the Air Force. The city even filed a lawsuit against the military. What they got was a bigger fight on their hands as people in surrounding communities and in Valparaiso backed the base. We like to see it. You know, most of the residents, I think, like to see it and certainly support the military. I've noticed the planes and I, I like them. It's cool to see them fly around. I wouldn't hesitate to have the aircraft in my backyard. The Air Force did finally settle and agree to new flight patterns. They're not flying over us very much, and we very much appreciate that. We spoke with the mayor of Valparaiso, who said he did not want to stir up the pot anymore by going on camera, but did say he is still waiting to see what the full impact of the F-35s will be on his city. The next step for Valparaiso is to see what happens as the Air Force expands training and puts even more F-35s in the air. You need to be somehow held to flying what they've modeled, or, or it's been a waste of time, <laughs> everybody's part. There was a lot of animosity. Kay Hamilton we warns not to let arguments day. tear the community apart like it did in Valparaiso. It was very divisive within the city, it was very divisive in the local area, it was very damaging to our relationships. She says it's so important for people on both sides of the issue to understand each other and to keep talking. We have committees that work hand in hand. Now with the military, we stay better informed. And, you know, they're here. So it, it has to work. Kay says the community is still healing from the fights over the F-35. She says, meantime, city leaders are still waiting to see what will happen when all 59 jets are on base and start their training program. David Schneider, News Channel 5.